Hello and welcome. <laughs> I'm Christine Perre. I am the chair of the Area Research Committee, and I also have had the pleasure of working with with members on the subject of interoperability and standards. Today's webinar focuses exactly on accelerating AR and IT integration through interoperability, getting things to talk to each other, work together. It's October 12th, 2023, and welcome. We're very happy to have you here. Um, we're going to have a um, uh, short introductions, and then my co-speakers are going to present some um, examples of integration, innovation, and we're going to talk about requirements that large enterprises have. And finally, I'll close out by sharing with you the highlights about our interoperability and standards program and encourage all of you to uh, get in touch or um, go to our website to find out more information about that program. So here we go. It's my pleasure to have with me here today, Blake Schurz and Gabe Sade. Um, Blake, tell us what you do in your day job. So I work at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. I am a augmented and virtual reality specialist. We have a team that's specifically around uh, improving the state of augmented and virtual reality use around the lab and for our sponsors. Um, and we call that the XR Collaboration Center. So I'm the section supervisor um, of that team. And I didn't uh, have the A right, the A word. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Gabe, what is your role and what do you do in your day job? Hi, Christine. My name is Gabe Saad. I'm an industry process consultant with the SO Systems, and my focus is around manufacturing operations management and uh, leveraging technology as an enabler to kind of uh, drive different outcomes uh, that's required of uh, manufacturing. You're both working in the trenches. I like to think of you as being very hands on with close up to the customer's uh, needs and probably addressing those to the best of your ability. Absolutely. Well, today's webinar is on the subject of interoperability and all the things that it provides, the benefits. However, I thought it would be important to start off with a couple of definitions because it might not be the most commonly used word. Um, so there's lots of different kinds of interoperability. And for sure, uh, interoperability is important in all fields, um, all, and not just technology fields, but um, you know, daily life. And I want to give you some definitions just as it, the term interoperability is used in the context of enterprise augmented reality. So we can call technologies or components or services interoperable when they offer a, a, a well-defined and, and uh, clean or clear way of transmitting and receiving data, for example, instructions, um, to and from enterprise IT systems. Those enterprise IT systems could be for, for planning, operations, or management, security, lots of different enterprise IT systems. And we can, we can benefit from interoperability when those AR technologies can quickly and, and without error um, speak with, communicate with those IT systems. Another definition of interoperability, interoperability that we sometimes use is if you have a multi-vendor solution, uh, you know, you've got software and hardware from multiple different providers, including IT systems or AR components. You might have an authoring environment from one, a game engine from another. Uh, you have some custom code that's uh, running around in there. And so we can say that components are interoperable when they serve um, as mandatory or optional components of this multi-vendor environment. And I think the multi-vendor environment is the rule in enterprise. It's not the exception. It's very much um, very common. And so 
uh, sometimes you need a piece of software to act as a shim or a, 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 an interface <coughs> to make sure that your multi-vendor solution operates smoothly and without uh, extra cost or hangups. So why, um, why do we think interoperability is important? Um, there are many reasons, but these are the ones that I think it all boils down to these. Um, as I mentioned, the rule is going to be this multi-vendor, multi-product environment. So when we can reduce the barriers to deploying that at scale, that's a huge benefit, lowers cost, uh, increases reliability. It also just lowers the cost of ownership over the total time that you're, you're managing these systems. It reduces the risk that you have a vendor lock-in. And many, many companies have experienced this, not in AR always, but in many industries, sometimes one vendor will become so uh, essential and then they're priorities might change, or they may not be updating the features of their product and platform at the same pace that you need them to be. And so that's when you need to be able to look around and evaluate your options. And if you have interoperability, then you are uh, in a better position for partnering with other companies or changing out components. It also increases innovation by lowering the threshold for companies that are specialized to enter our ecosystem. What do I mean by that? Well, they can companies who are maybe not specialists in augmented reality, but for example, we're going to hear about manufacturing use cases or navigation use cases or some uh, other applications. So the companies may, these third parties may have excellent solutions to offer uh, and with interoperability, if they can write to a well-published APIs or uh, adhere or implement standards, then there's new opportunities that are created. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute. In fact, this is the slide on which I wanted to have that kind of conversation with my panelists today. Um, the real center of our, of our webinar is this equation which is actually not a linear left to right equation. It's, it's a virtuous cycle. And um, I'd like to ask Blake, um, uh, do you have some comments or some things you want to add to this figure? And how, how do you think uh, you yeah. describe it when people ask you that question? It, it, it's interesting because when we started, right, uh, a lot of the funds, especially in the early days for um, what has become my lab and my team were provided by the lab's innovation funds, right? And they're just, oh, we want you to be innovative. But being innovative is this weird nebulous thing. Everybody wants to be innovative, right? But what does it actually, being innovative is never the goal, right? It is something that gets you to the goal, right? It's the thing that gets you the thing. Um, really what we need long-term as we're talking about it is capability. That's really the objective is to have better capability and, you know, be able to do more. Um, or sometimes there's also a value thing, right? Be able to do the same thing at a better value, but usually drive, you know, comes down to some level of capability. Um, as you build capability, you need things also to be more usable. Um, you can't spend all of your time training on, you know, esoteric tools, um, and it also means if you want things to be able to be usable, when we're talking in the enterprise sense, um, you have to integrate it with other stuff. You know, gone are the days of where, you know, we want one login for every application, right? We, we need things like single sign-on. We want our data to be portable between systems. Um, so as we start talking about how do we integrate our business practices and our applications and our tools, we need them to be interoperable. Um, which also accelerates innovation because now I have access to all of the things to do my job. I can remix them and look at them in different ways and uh, provide new functionality that works more than just one thing. Um, and that helps innovation and, and round and round we go. Uh, yeah, I think about 
modular, you know, that's a key word for me is modularity. And that increases your degrees of freedom for innovation and capability. Um, for, the, for the software engineers out yeah. there, right? Uh, encapsulation, you know, when I was being trained, um, you know, that was, you know, a big, big part of object oriented programming, um, interfaces and, and encapsulation and nowadays APIs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, Blake had a lot of good points there. I just wanted to add is, uh, Christine, you mentioned earlier, kind of uh, interoperability to the different systems, because uh, as far as vendor locking goes, the reality is, is um, customers are asking more and more for uh, the capability to, uh, they don't want to do a rip and replace. They want to have the ability to augment technology and add value right into their ecosystem. So I'm kind of talking from a manufacturing, but also an operational technology point of view where um, similar to Blake and stuff, I, I had to support the back end systems and I had to ha handle the integrations and interoperability across the different enterprise systems. From a manufacturing perspective, you mentioned it earlier, there's so many different systems that AR augmented reality could provide uh, a value to and, and it would touch. So leveraging uh, data through APIs, uh, common data model and such, I think that'll be a, a, a big driver um, that would provide a lot of positive outcomes for, for folks across different industries, right? Whether, you know, I look at this slide and I like to refer to it as the circle of life, right? Because interoperability to me, if I look at it right there, is going to be the enabler to provide, uh, to drive innovation, uh, required capabilities, and then um, to Blake's point, usability of the technology, right? If it's easy to use, uh, user adoption and such will be, uh, it'll be easier to kind of melt into your ecosystem. And then of course, integration to those different systems, right? So I, I think uh, this is a great slide to summarize where, because I know personally from the manufacturing perspective, there's so many different systems augmented reality could uh, provide value to. Exactly. Um, okay, so that's that's um, really good value, and we're going to come back to this. I think over the course of the next forty-five minutes, we'll be we'll be returning to these ideas. Um, so, I wanted to give some concrete examples of what interoper how you might achieve interoperability. So the the road, uh, you know the. The, the stones, so to speak, on the way. Um, so the way I look at this is that there, there are um, providers of technologies and then there are the customers that are deploying technologies for AR. And we can each uh, do things differently because um, the providers of technology can be uh, exposing APIs so that um, other companies can easily access uh, you know, the, understand how the communications is done and how to exchange data with that system. So this publishing APIs is a key, uh, a, a, a key step that we see providers doing. We also can publish open source libraries um, if your company doesn't need that for differentiation or to, uh, you know, to upsell, then you might be able to release certain libraries um, and increase the interoperability with your system. If you've implemented it first and then you release that out, it's proven and you can release that to the ecosystem, there'd be other companies that can come along and uh, adapt their interfaces or uh, take advantage of the work that you've done uh, in order to lower that threshold for cooperation. And I think all members of the ecosystem can better understand what's going on in standards development. That's not an easy task to do. I, I, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Um, there's just so many organizations. But you know, at the end of the day, what's important is that you pay attention to the standards that are relevant to your industry. Like if you're in pharmaceuticals or you're in manufacturing or you're in aviation or automotive, you, you're going to want to pay attention first and foremost to the standards that are in your industry. 
And then there are graphics standards and there are um, interface standards that you can also start to look at. But what's important is be aware, uh, become a member, and then eventually, if you feel that you can, participate and contribute. You can contribute if you're an enterprise customer. You can contribute by giving requirements. Standards development organizations are only good as only as good as the requirements that they meet. If and when a standard meets requirements, it gets adopted. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's that, that's the, the ticket. So you can also, as an enterprise, advocate to your partners and and other companies that you work with to adopt these different approaches, whether they're uh, open source approaches or publishing an API or uh, implementing a standard. So those are concrete examples of what we mean by what can you do? Um, and we did a survey over the first half of this year asking area members if, if they thought this was an important topic. And that's why we're here today talking to you is because we discovered that it is an, a very important to most area members, they are thinking about it. They are, some of them, even a third of our members that responded to this survey said, they're very actively talking and, and probably working and testing code um, to, to increase interoperability. So this is, this is a real um, important milestone, I feel. But, that's kind of the introduction of our webinar to tell you why uh, interoperability is something to aim for, why it's a goal. And now I'm going to turn it over to Blake to um, share with us examples that are uh, uh, live and, and real from your lab, uh, from, from, from the lab there. So please go ahead and advance the slides at your speed. Thank you, Blake. Yep. Thank you. All right. So... <clears throat> Here at the lab, we do a lot of you know research, uh, government consulting type work, um, and we've had a number of things where there's been an additional push for digital engineering and doing more with 3D models. And we have been um, uh, not particularly thrilled with many of the industry offerings because they're lacking in some way. We have a very tight security profile as enterprise. Um, we have a lot of constraints as to um, uh, how user authentication can and should be done and where our data goes. Uh, we do not adopt cloud easily. Um, and in many cases, we have to follow government um, requirements for government uh, data, and we can't use a lot of cloud. And many of the startups in the augmented reality world don't use, um, you know, they, they don't follow these government standards uh, because they, they are significant. Um, and so we end up having a lot of our processing and tooling on-prem and we can't use a lot of what we see in terms of startup applications. So we actually built, uh, started designing our own collaborative 3D environment um, after years of looking and hoping that industry would provide us something that we, we could use, we finally decided to uh, design our own. So we have the di digital engineering toolkit. So this is a collaborative tool. So it is a, a VR space where you can have multiple people come in, look at a CAD model, draw annotations, talk about it, move it around, move parts of it, um, and be able to work with each other. And it is designed from the ground up to be as everything agnostic as we could possibly design it. Right, so that we've had previous tools, but it would lock us into a specific device, right? So we had one program that worked on one device, and then the manufacturer of that device had decided, well, maybe they're going to continue to make these, maybe they won't. There's a lot uh, up in the air about what's going on with those devices, and, and they have a big push to use their cloud with the device, which we can't necessarily use. So we said, when we design ours, we need to be ag super agnostic, right? Um, and that we're focused on our enterprise architecture and designing our systems to be modular so that we can, as our needs change, we can switch out modules and be able to use the application effectively. So for example, instead of using one vendor specific 
um, uh, XR subsystem. We moved over to OpenXR so that we can use this device. Uh, we can use almost any device um, that is available to us for this virtual environment. Uh, we've done it with Quests and Vibes and Varios. We've tested all kinds of things um, and it works. Um, we've also moved over to uh, Enterprise Single Sign-On and this is actually one place where I'm, I'm going to talk about the difference between standards and interoperability. We have at APL, unsurprisingly, an enterprise authentication system that is one company's approach to doing it. And, um, you know, they use LDAP um, to do that. But that is, it is a standard, but it's a, a very, it's an older standard. It's not particularly convenient. And it's not designed to integrate with things like game engines and stuff like that, right? Game engines don't have enterprise in mind. Um, but we started looking at moving over to OAuth. So OAuth is a standard for authentication and that we have implemented an OAuth um, authentication hook into our app so that we can now use an OAuth uh, uh, provider that our lab has recently adopted. We've also tested it with multiple OAuth uh, providers so that if we as APL decide that they want to move from one single sign-on vendor to another single sign-on vendor, it's no big deal. So even though we were we would interoperate with a, uh, our, our old LDAP system, now with OAuth, we have a simple web services interface that we can just use the enterprise single sign-on. And if our enterprise decides that they need to change vendors, or if we have an isolated network that is does not have internet connectivity, so long as authentication on that network uses OAuth, we're going to be able to easily adapt our system to be able to work on uh, either network, whether it's the highly secure or less secure networks. Um, we've also created a uh, mechanism to have a RESTful interface to process CAD files, right? So one of the things is as we work on spacecraft, you know, Pluto New Horizons or Parker Solar Probe, right? We get in these really big, uh, amazing engineer CAD models, right? We're getting the real deal models. Um, and uh, we need a mechanism to be able to process them easily. And so we've used RESTful processing to take those application files and then have a standard processing pipeline that helps us get to a model that we're then able to use in this app. But again, what's interesting is um, we're able to make these available for other things as well. So the other thing we have is an enterprise file sharing system. Uh, we use one vendor. In our case, um, you know, we have it set up that as far as our system knows, it's just a folder on the computer. So again, if we change enterprise file sharing systems from one vendor to another, um, our application is just looking at files on a shared folder. And what's nice about it is that we are inheriting all of the access controls and everything to that folder in ways that people are already used to using. Our application doesn't actually have to do all, it, we don't have to implement all of that person management code because the actual data that our application runs on is in those folders and is already managed by our enterprise file sharing system. So we were able to not worry about our file system. We were able to not worry about our authentication. We didn't have to worry about our CAD processing. So the team that was working on this experience was able to focus right on that experience, which is why we say this accelerates innovation because there's all of this overhead code that we're so used to having to write that we didn't have to touch at all. Um, and that as systems change again, it's very modular. We can swap out or you know, our system might not even notice, right? If we changed uh, enterprise file sharing systems, our app wouldn't, wouldn't even care. Um, so that's, you know, so designing uh, in a modular approach really facilitates um, uh, being able to uh, in interoperate and be modular. Uh, but to do that, you need standards like, you know, again, your, your file system or OAuth or OpenXR. Um, <clears throat> another kind of standard we have is uh, when we're talking about our code, uh, we, our network code specifically in this case. Um, we had a problem, right, where uh, we have 
environments. I mentioned we have different different environments at different levels of security, and they don't necessarily allow the same network protocols to be able to use be used as we go between these networks, right? And and or uh, something that we could put out on the public internet, we might not be able to use if we host it internally in our own network. Um, so we also, as we're building out our tools, we aren't even necessarily beholden to a particular game engine, which, um, you know, for many people, if we've looked at news from two of the, both of the two big vendors of game engines this in the last month or so, um, you know, is, is shows why we might want to be mindful of being able to switch game engines. Um, so, you know, we, we are designing our tools so that our networking isn't baked into, we're not using the in-game engine networking code. We want to be able to have desktop apps be able to use it. We want to be able to create web apps that can be equal partners along with our XR tools or whatever it is that we do. So to do that, what we've done is we've designed ourselves around interfaces. So we've said the networking protocol is really focused on how to send the data. How does how do these packets get from a server to a client, right? But really what our applications care about, right, is what data gets sent. And this is, I'm gonna send a new position for this object that I'm looking at. I'm, somebody has moved in the room, I wanna send an updated position or the lighting has changed and I need to send updated lighting information. That is what needs to be sent as opposed to how it gets sent. So what we do is we focus our code, our primary network code is focused on what needs to get sent. And then we have a generation tool that takes that messages of, this is the data that we need to send. This is what gets sent. And then it will actually generate our network code that says, how does it get sent? And so when we're developing in our applications, we are at the very high level just saying, send a message that has the lighting data, send a message that has the player position data. Right, and that it's calling a library that figures out the how. What that also means is that in the future, right, if we go to another network where one networking technology may not be approved, but another one is, that we can say, all right, we can keep the content of the message, what gets sent the same, we don't actually care that much. And then we generate all new code of how to send it but our applications, the things that we work on, don't actually care because it's the library, right? And so really it's just some addresses and endpoints. From a networking perspective, we might care about efficiency and there are some other changes, but so much of our code, all of that effort is still completely valid because we don't have to rewrite all of our networking everything because it's focusing on what to send, not how to send it. Um, and that the how to send it is actually pretty boring and routine once you understand the various types of data that you can send the how to send it uh, we auto generate that code and it only takes seconds um so you know again we can change network st standards we can change out pretty much whatever we need to uh in a very flexible way and we're not beholden to any one platform engine piece of hardware um anything like that um, and then lastly, so I actually mentioned this in deck a little bit, um, the CAD to appearance model pipeline. This is something that we're using right now. It was used for deck originally, but it's actually now being able to be used in a broader sense because it was an encapsulated, isolated capability where um, it helps us solve this problem. You're right, we have different projects with different 3D models, different tools, different all, all kinds of stuff, right? And then they would output um, various things. And there is always a long process of sitting there and figuring out what CAD tools did they have and what files could we import? And, you know, are we getting things like Blender in the middle as we're figuring out how to go that? Um, and then there's also common problems about orientation, uh, not having textures. Sometimes you have issues with sensitive content. Um, you can't necessarily publish all the parts of a model to everybody. Um, and then very often with CAD, you end up with too many polygons at the end. Um, so we have a standard 3D model processing pipeline and we put a web API, a RESTful API on it. Um, and so we have these tools in the back end so that as engineers produce things, they just have a single button that they can click and it will output a file in a specific format at a specific polygon level 
so that we can reuse that in our game engines. We can use that in um, design reviews. We can use that, you know, we can uh, take snapshots shots of them and put them in PowerPoint very easily. We can public release those models in, in some of the big PR events. Again, like with spacecraft, there's usually big PR things anytime a major milestone has been um, with like Dart and whatnot. Um, so, so we are able to take those models and have one processing pipeline and have a very reliable output result, which we can leverage uh, for a bunch of different tools and processes, not just a one processing pipeline per application like pretty much what happened before. I think that's me. Okay, great. Thanks, Blake. I think what you've been describing is uh, your role, you kind of have a foot in, in two camps. One is you are purchasing commercial solutions from vendors, and you're also developing um, additional pipelines, additional um, interfaces so that they can meet the needs of your customers. And I think yes. that's um, the second is kind of an integration role, uh, the role of an integrator, um, which we often see in, in enterprise AR projects. Now I'm, I'm going to invite Gabe to speak about from, from a different perspective. Um, Gabe, as he introduced himself, and Paul, who's also on the webinar, they are coming from this as providers of components and services and platforms which support augmented reality. And I asked them to talk about what, from the customer's point of view, are the requirements. What are they asking for in terms of interoperability or, um, or being, being able to integrate? So, Gabe? Awesome. Love to hear your your talk. Yeah, I see how this is all kind of connecting together because when Blake's talking about uh, the we'll call it the back end, right? Kind of building the foundation to facilitate AR across these different systems. And then you talked about earlier, Christine, around vendor lock in. Our customers are telling us some similar stuff, right? They want to have the ability to collect and share data across the different layers of the ISA ninety five model. The ISA 95 model is from the International Society of Automation. And we're going to, I'm going to show you a diagram of that in a second. What it is, is it's a breakdown of all the different enterprise systems all the way down to the automation layer. So from an enterprise point of view, it's essentially uh, different enterprise systems passing data along, uh, whether it's through manufacturing, uh, ERP, et cetera, and kind of having a digital thread. The challenge is today is there's different ways to pass it. Um, and what they're really looking for is the ability around having a common sub common APIs so they can uh, gather and share information to augmented reality solutions, uh, but also compatibility and interoperability with manufacturing execution systems, manufacturing operations management systems, product lifecycle management systems, um, computerized maintenance management systems and quality management systems. and I'm going to show you here in a second why that's important. So you, what, what you see here is what they're really asking us for is alignment to the ISA 95 model, which I said earlier, right? So for instance, we know with augmented reality, there's so many different use cases. Uh, I know in particular from a manufacturing perspective, I have customers that want to use augmented reality to kind of inspect uh, an incoming inspection of supplier parts, right? And they want to take this information and they want to capture this part of the genealogy in, into the manufacturing of their product, right? So what that requires is information to be passed from AR, perhaps an inspection record, over into maybe the ERP system, right, to an as-built system. And then maybe back down to an MES again, where during execution, these supplier parts are consumed into a final assembly they build, right? And they want to have all these different characteristics. So having the ability to push and pull information to different systems is very crucial for a lot of our customers. But even from a perspective around uh, operator assembly, right? Um, when you see layers one and two, right? Our customers are asking us to have the ability to pass information from uh, industrial tooling over into augmented reality to, to validate 
correct torque values, uh, uh, tool characteristics are, are been maintained, et cetera, uh, during the execution. So what they're really trying to do is they're not looking for one solution. They're looking for a, a solution that can basically uh, kind of support the different uh, enterprise systems within their ecosystem. So many different use cases. Uh, our customers are using it for manufacturing execution, assembly assistance, um, probably aligned with uh, uh, when Blake was talking about the gaming. A lot of them are using it for uh, operator training and enablement, right? You can, especially with mm -hmm. customers with large, expensive assets, maybe a jet engine or something. They, they can't have a jet engine there. What they can do is they can merge the operator into a virtual environment, leveraging augmented reality to perform operator training. And then more importantly, they can validate if it was done correctly. And it gets, you know, what it does is it gets the operators up to speed uh, much quicker. Assembly assistance, it puts quality in line, right? And it, it just, it produces a better outcome for our customers, right? They can, they produce a better product, but more importantly, and you mentioned it earlier, right? The different uh, regulated industries, industries such as aerospace and defense, life sciences, information has to be captured a certain way, maintained a certain way and validated in some instances, right? So having the ability, uh, the interoperability and the ability to uh, share information through a say, uh, common APIs, data model, et cetera, that's what they've been really asking us for. So um, my colleague, Paul is on the line too. I'm sure he probably has some things to add as well. <laughs> Thank you, Gabe. It was very well explained, very Thank clear. Um, well, I I don't hear Paul chiming in, so I'm gonna I'm Does gonna. Me? Uh, so now I do. Yes, okay. hi. Yeah, you know, uh, Gabe really uh, provided a, a very complete understanding about what the customers are asking for. Um, I can one thing I would add is is at the end of the day, the goal is to provide uh, uh, the the tools that a, that a shop floor operator needs to get their job done in the most safe and the most efficient way. Ultimately, the goal and what is our goal um, whenever we deploy AR in a production environment is actually to make the technology transparent mm -hmm. as if it didn't even exist. We're simply giving better instructions, more uh, interactive instructions to the operator. And what that means is that the, no matter what your demographics are, you have the capability to leverage tools to do a better job and to communicate, collaborate with your engineering team in a much more efficient manner. I, I really like how you summarize that. We don't have to draw attention to the fact that it's delivered in AR view. What's most important is the customer's KPIs, right? The customer's <clears throat> metrics. And you have those over on the, uh, you know, on the right hand side of this figure, you know, doing, delivering and building the right product at the right time with the minimum of waste and minimum of risk. Those are the metrics that matter uh, mm. for any enterprise. And we're in, enabling the information to get to that operator uh, when they need it. Mm -hmm. so that's really well, well put. That speaks for all AR, I guess, not uh, exclusively when it's integrated and interoperable, but it is yes. important. All right, I'm going to wrap up uh, with um, talking with you and sharing with our audience what the area is working on, uh, including my uh, esteemed speakers today, that we're working on a program to um, help the whole ecosystem understand um, what exists and and you know and why it matters actually it's pretty much boiling it down to what is there and why do you care so we want to help both the customers and the provider segments um, to understand how that those standards and interoperability can help them and I, w I really appreciate the insights of these two um, speakers and, and Paul as well. We also, in order to have um, better standards going forward, 
we're going to need to have these customer organizations or those who work with them boil down their requirements so that we can focus the attention of standards development on what matters, just the requirements, not the need, the, the nice to haves. Um, we're also working to identify interfaces where they exist between AR components that can provide that integration, that interoperability. Those interfaces can be uh, released in the, uh, they could be published on a vendor site or they could be open source and GitHub or anywhere. But we, we need more of those experimental, um, ex not just experimental, but exposure where, where we can see clearly documented how information is brought in and, and how it uh, is used in a system. We want to engage with organizations and you may be um, attendees of this webinar to, um, to help us speak about standards to uh, the standards development organizations or promotions. It may be just help us to talk internally in our own companies about what's available and why you care. So what's available and why you need, uh, need these components. So building a base of professionals that have the vocabulary and that have the skills to go and grab existing standards or help develop new ones as needed. So we are developing content in addition to webinars, of course, we'll have a fireside chat, blog posts, um, all the tools, you know, modern tools for communicating to the industry and share our member requirements to provide feedback um, whenever we're asked and perhaps to develop um, uh, to te test beds. Um, we can imagine that we might uh, create some uh, sandboxes where um, different uh, projects can be exposed and tested by our members. And then that gives us more validation or feedback if, uh, if that's necessary. And if any of our members on the provider side or the customer side have implementation libraries or com standard compliant APIs, we want to we want to promote those and make them available to people. So that's the end of our um, of our prepared remarks today. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry, Paul, don't have your picture there. Last minute uh, change in plans, but um, our contact information appears on this screen. We welcome all of you to uh, to get in touch and um, certainly to not uh, diminish uh, the attention that you give to interoperability and standards, but to in fact increase the attention that you're going to be putting on that because it's going to be very, very important to the future of uh, successful deployments, especially scale and production deployments. Gentlemen, Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I wish you all a great rest of your day. <laughs>